Good morning. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday Isaiah study. We're in Isaiah 17 and verse 1. And before we get started, Brother Chad's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be able to be here this morning and to hear a lesson from your word. We're, we're thankful for Mike for preparing this material and presenting it to us. Father, be with us as hearers to take in that information and learn from it. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, that came down to earth and died for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you, if you don't have your little workbook, you're going to need it today. There's a, a, I made, made a couple up there. I've been handing them out forever, so you should have them because you're going to need it because we're going to be covering quite a bit of material. As we get through here, we are today in Isaiah chapter 17, and we're looking at this section that deals with the oracles that God has written uh, against uh, the nations and against various people. Uh, we are in uh, 17 uh, or 16 through 18 is, is our lesson that we're, we're at, which is page 44 on your notes. So you want to turn there because we're going to be looking at the outline on chapter 17 and 18. Because like I said last week, we're not going to be able to cover every single verse or else we're going to spin forever in Isaiah. I gave you most of the important uh, concepts and ideas. And so now we're just going to skim through a bunch of stuff. As we go through this, remember that all of these oracles or these burdens, depending on if you have the King James Version, King James Version calls them oracles uh, or burdens. The New American Standard renders it oracles. Uh, they're, they're simply messages about a judgment that God has on various groups and various um, um, nations. And you remember that in the first um, t uh, 12, God was dealing with Israel and the judgment on them. And then in verses 13 through 15, God began to deal with the nations. And we're in that section that runs all the way to chapter 24. So like I said, we're going to cover a lot of these. Also remember that it's written in what's referred to as apocalyptic language. Apocalyptic language, I don't know if you ever saw the movie uh, 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 Apocalypse Now, which was about the Vietnam War. At the very beginning, it had all these helicopters flying by and these jets, and it, was, it had a lot of, lot of animation to it. And, and that's what apocalypse means. Apocalypse means it's exaggerated, it, it's, it's vivid, it's kind of in-your-face type stuff. So remember that it's, it's actually poetic language, so if you're looking for... Uh, for fulfillment of every single detail, you might not get them at least and not the way not in the way that you're thinking because they're not meant to be necessarily taken each individual thing literally, but they're pictures of things that are going on during the judgments. And so in chapter 17, we covered chapter 16 last week, and if you look on your paper there on page 44, and like I said, there's booklets up there if you need one, on page 44, which covered the burden, uh, of Moab in chapter 16, you had uh, the fact that God was bringing judgment on Moab and what Moab was going to do as a result of that. And so now we're down here in chapter 17. And if you look on your notes, it says uh, uh, on page 44 there in your notes, it says uh, the burden of Syria and Israel, the 10 northern tribes. So remember that as we're looking at these individuals, we're looking at the time that these 10 tribes are getting carried away into captivity. And this burden has to do with that time period. And so you have here uh, in verse in chapter 17, and if you if you look on your on your outline there, uh, verses one through five deals with the destruction of Syria and Israel, probably during the rule of Ahaz. And so Ahaz is right here. Here's Ahaz. So it's right there during that period that probably this oracle was written. Oh, the other thing to remember is that it gives you an it might give you an oracle or a prophecy, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the prophecy is going to take place immediately, or that every single part of the prophecy will take place immediately. Uh, many times God gives us a prophecy, and it takes quite a while for it to finally develop all the way it's supposed to develop. So if you're looking for the fulfillment of this, like in a year or two, uh, it might not happen in a year or two. It might take decades. Uh, in order for them to happen. Uh, for example, when he, when he speaks about Israel and about the destruction of the city of Israel, he writes about that during this time, but it doesn't happen until way over here in AD 70. It doesn't happen until way over here in AD 70. And so even though the prophecy is made over here during this time period, it doesn't happen for another almost five, 600 years. So remember that. He, even as he speaks about the, the prophecies that are going to happen, they don't necessarily mean they're going to happen immediately, although some of the things will happen immediately, but the totality of the prophecy might take years in order for it to fully be 
uh, realized or fully be accomplished. And that doesn't mean that God's not keeping his promise. As a matter of fact, it means God is. He's remembering what his, what his prophecies were. So in, in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, uh, what you have here, as we pointed out in the first five verses, is we have the destruction of Syria and Israel. And so he starts off the oracle concerning Damascus. That's the capital of, of Syria during that time. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a, a city and will become a fallen ruin. The city of uh, Aror are forsaken. They will, they, they will be uh, flocks to, uh, they will be for flocks to lie down in, and there will be no one to frighten them. Uh, and, and in other words, frighten the flocks because there's no people around. So the idea is that the Damascus is going to disappear. Verse 3, the fortified cities will disappear from Ephraim. And remember, Ephraim was the, the northern tribes. Uh, as you look at the map, Ephraim was this group over here. Let me give you, see if, Ephraim was up here. So there's Ephraim. This place up here became known as Ephraim, and that's where the uh, Syrians ruled for a while. And that's where the woman at the well, who was a S Samaritan, that's kind of her origins, came from there. Uh, now, it says in verse 4, Now, in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. In other words, Jude is going to be destroyed. Uh, Linda, were you able to hear anything outside? Okay. Uh, and it says, uh, it, it will be even like the, the, the reaper gathering the, the standing grain. In other words, he's giving you the example of when, when uh, there's a harvest and you go through and you grab all the grapes, do they grab every single grape? No, there might be a couple of little bitty stragglers, right? Well, that's the way it is when Assyria invades Israel, the 10 northern tribes. There's going to be a few people left, but pretty much they're going to be gone. And that's what he's talking about in the gleaning here. Verse 7, he says, In that day man will have regard for his maker. In other words, during this time, when God has left only a remnant of this people, Israel over here, we go back over here to this chart. Uh, right, right here, God is going to leave a remnant of these people. That's who the woman at the well is. She's part of that remnant that was left right here. When Israel was then occupied by, by Syria, and they sent for a priest, and they kind of became the half-breed group. Uh, but no doubt there were other people there. And so when Jesus, when Jesus comes over here during this time, during the rule of Jesus, he says, in that day man will have regard for his maker. In other words, after all of this happens, then they're going to turn to the Lord. And his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. In other words, they had been over here. The reason they fell was because they were worshiping idols. But now over here, they're going to turn to God, and they're going to follow God. He says uh, in verse 8, he, he will not have regard for, for the altars, the work of his hands, nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the ashram and incense stands. So, in other words, they had been following idols here, but during this time over here, they're not going to follow idols. During this time over here, you and I don't follow idols. You and I follow God. He says uh, in, in verse 9, In that day, uh, their strong cities will, will, uh, will be like forsaken places in the forest, or like branches which they abandoned before the sons of Israel, and the land will be desolate. So God's going to leave the land desolate. That could have a reference to what happens here in Jerusalem in 70 AD when God destroys uh, Israel from off the land. Uh, it says in verse 10, For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not re re remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore you plant delightful plants and set them with vine slips of a strange God. In other words, when God is destroying them, when God is bringing this destruction on them, he's telling them why, and that is because they have become idolatrous. Verse 11 says, In that day uh, that you uh, plant it, you carefully fence it in, and in the morning you, you bring your seed to blossom, but the harvest will be a heap in, in a day of sickness and incurable pain. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of, of mighty water. And so he talks about here in, in verse 12, uh, he talks about the, the overthrow of the enemy of, uh, and the army that God is going to use to overthrow those who are wicked, whether it's Israel or Damascus, when, when, they're, when they're wicked. Okay. And so in verse uh, 14, he says, or in verse 13, he says, The nations rumble like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them, and they will flee, flee far away. So the nations that came against Israel over here, even though God used Syria in order to destroy or to 
uh, chastise Israel, the ten northern tribes, uh, they are going to come to an end themselves, it says, and be, ch and be ch chased, uh, uh, chased like shaft in the mountain before the wind, or like whirling dust before a, a gale. At evening time, behold, there is terror. Before morning, uh, uh, they are no more. Such will be the portions of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. So as God talks about the judgment he's bringing on them through Assyria, or through Syria, he also says that Syria is going to be punished. That's why this oracle is about Damascus. But it also includes Israel in here, and it includes the fact that God is going to restore those people who are faithful to him during this time period over here where Jesus comes. Now, uh, one of the things to think about is these people died, right? They died over here. So how does this do them any good over here? If they, if they died over here in 606 or around that period, how does what happens over here in 33 AD, how does that help them? So wasn't there a remnant? Yes. The reason it helps them is because the sacrifice of Jesus goes backwards and forward. So the people who died over here who were faithful to God, that remnant... Those people that were trying to serve the Lord, the blood of Jesus cleanses them, and that's when they become part of God's family, and that's when they become a part of his church that you and I are part of, whether it's here in, in a physical realm that we can see, or whether it's up in heaven, we're all part of the same uh, kingdom or the same rule. So remember that as we go through here. All right, uh, anything on 17? Okay, like I said, we're going to cover these fast, so if you have your 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 notes, it'll do you some good. Now, in chapter 18, it's a little difficult for us to uh, exactly know whether this is talking uh, uh, about, uh, uh, whether it's talking about uh, Ethiopia. Some people think that it might be talking about Assyria, but either way, it's talking about the enemy. Probably talking about Ethiopia is what's probably under consideration. He says, uh, and this is fairly uh, well, it's one of the short ones. He says in 18.1, he says, Alas, O land of whirling, whirling winds, which lies beyond the rivers of Cush. Uh, how many of you have ever seen any documentaries on Africa and the safari and those places? You ever seen any of those? Okay. Uh, have you noticed that almost every time you watch one of those, you can see somewhere in the background whirling wind and like a little, like a little tornado. You know, we call them dirt devils, right? Little dirt devils flying around. Well, that's what he's talking about here. So, so these are the people from Ethiopia or the area of Africa around that, around that area. He says, which send envoys by the sea, even in papyrus vessels on the surface of the waters, go, uh, go uh, swift messengers to the nation tall and smooth, to a people uh, a feared far and wide, a powerful and an oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. So th they sent their, their envoys uh, to come against uh, Israel and yet God is sending them back home. He's sending the messengers back home. Uh, in other words, they're, they're, they're not going to accomplish their task. Verse 3, he says, all, all you inhabitants of, of the world and dwellers on earth, as soon as the standard is raised on the mountain, you will see it. And as soon as the trumpet is blown, you will hear it. And so in uh, verse 3, he's talking about the nations are called to witness what's going on. So God often calls the, the, a witness when he's going to do something. Uh, whenever you testify in court, you always call a witness. Whenever you notarize something, you always have witnesses, that sign, right? And the witnesses verify that you're going to do what you said you, you did. And, and that's, what, that's what you have here in verse 3. When he talks about all, uh, all you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, he's calling them as witness. Come see, come look at what's going on. Because God's going to do this. Now, verse 4. He says, For thus the Lord has told me, I will look from my dwelling place quiet, uh, quiet, uh, quietly, like uh, dazzling heat in the, in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of the harvest. Now, uh, again, remember, this is apocalyptic language. It's kind of difficult sometimes to figure out what he's saying, but it, sa it sounds like what he's saying in, in verse 4 is that God is going to look like he's ignoring the situation. As this is happening, it looks like God is ignoring the situation. But in verse 5, it says uh, uh, that God is actually going to be with Israel, and he's going to defeat the enemy. He says, for, for before the harvest, as soon as the bud blossoms and the flower becomes a ripening uh, grape, then he will cut off the sprigs with, with pruning knives and remove and cut away the, the spreading branches. In other words, uh, what God's saying is, 
that uh, oftentimes in order for, for discipline to happen, what does it have to look like? When you discipline your children, what does it look like to them when you're disciplining them? Matter of fact, we all say the same thing. What do we, what do we tell them if we're going to spank them? It's going to hurt us more than it hurts you. You don't think this is for your good. It looks like I don't care because I'm going to spank you. And it looks like I don't care, but it's actually I'm doing it for your good, right? That's what this is saying as far as the nations go. It, it, God is stepping back while he allows these things to happen so that Israel will learn to depend and trust on God. That's, that's why God is doing this. But he's going to cut the branches down. He is going to, he is going to help them. Verse 6, he says, uh, they will be left together for mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the earth, and the birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them, and all the beasts of the earth will, will spend uh, harvest time on them. In other words, they're going to be destroyed like a, a uh, gleaning of a, of a field, and then after they glean it, the birds come down and they eat what's left, and they take what's left, and the animals take what's left, and the, the individual doesn't care. That's what's going to happen to the nations that are against Israel. Verse 7, he says, at this time, for at that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts from the people tall and smooth, even from a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of, uh, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Z uh, Zion. So he even talks about, about the Ethiopians that after God uses them and basically turns them into a third world country that they too will be able to come to God over here, and they too will be able to bring gifts to God, and they will be able to be saved if they're faithful to God. Because the promise to Abraham over here was for who? All nations. And the Ethiopians are a nation, right? So they're, they're going to be able to receive the blessings that are found in there. So that's the burden on, on Cush or Ethiopia. Now, chapter 19, verse 1, you have the oracle concerning uh, uh, Egypt, and this starts on your on page forty eight in your booklet. Yes. And we see that in Acts eight, right, about the eunuch. Yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch. Yes. Yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch was, was baptized in Acts eight, and it, it specifically mentions he's from Ethiopia, right. so that we understand that God's fulfilling His promise that He said over here. Mm -hmm. And so remember that that e, that God's plan is to save everybody, not just to save the Jews but to save everybody, right? But he uses different means for however he can in order to save them. Now, chapter 19. In chapter 19, is the oracle concerning uh, Egypt. So this was an happening. Now, remember Egypt on our map, in case you don't quite remember, Egypt is right, uh, come on, don't, there it is. Egypt is right there. See, there's Egypt. Now, you can't see it real well, but here's Canaan. Here's the, the uh, Dead Sea, here's the Sea of Galilee. So this is the land of Israel when they go in and possess the land from the Canaanites. They're going to go and possess this land and a little bit on this side. And here's Egypt down here. And Egypt was considered a world power. They were considered a world power during this time. So if you wanted, if you wanted to uh, fight, uh, if you were a nation and you wanted to fight against another nation, but you weren't very strong, who would you go to help for? To Egypt. Just like today... When uh, um, who did Russia invade? You thank you, Ukraine. Uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, who did they come to for help? Us. They came to us, and we're sending them billions of dollars for the war, right? But so you go to you go to a, a you go to a world power, somebody that can help you. Well, that's what you got going on in here. Egypt or uh, uh, Israel and Judah, Israel Israel up here and Judah right here, when they got into trouble, rather than trusting God, when they were in their unfaithful periods, rather than trusting God, when a nation was going to come against them, they would run over here to Egypt, and they would make agreements with Egypt. Egypt, come save us. If, if the Assyrians come or the Babylonians come, will you come and fight, fight with us and help us, and, and, and that way we can defeat them, right? Chapter 19. And so basically in chapter 19, what you have is the fact that God turns Egypt into what you and I refer to as a third world country. Now, a third world country means that they are a country, they're recognized as a country, but they're not of real significance. What's the last thing you've ever heard that Egypt has done or accomplished? 
they're a good place to visit because they have the pyramids and all that stuff, but politically and, and nationally, they haven't really done anything. Well, why? Because God turned them into a third world country, and here's where he's doing this. Now, as he does that, we want to look at some apocalyptic literature so that we can understand exactly Isaiah 11, 1. The oracle concerning Egypt, behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Now, I want you to notice how it says that, that he is coming to them. How is he coming to them? He's riding on a cloud. That's how he's going to come to them. He's, he's riding on a cloud. Now, do you remember when, when Jesus was uh, being tried? And in Matthew chapter 26, and they were asking him, are you the king of Israel? The, the Pharisees were, and, the, and the, the, the Sanhedrin was, right? And Jesus, and they made Jesus swear. They said, do you swear? Do you, you know, we're, we're putting you under an oath. If you were put under an oath, you were supposed to answer the question. That's the only reason why Jesus answered the question. And Jesus said to them, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard of the blasphemy. So the idea of coming on the clouds is the idea of God's presence coming. It's the idea of God coming in judgment. Uh, and, and that's also found uh, in Matthew, where, where uh, um, in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says that they're going to see him come in the clouds. Uh, let me see if I can find that for you real fast here. Um, in, uh, Isaiah, in Matthew 24 and verse 29, it says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars of heaven will fall from, from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And, the, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they, uh, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, that's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. And it says that he's coming in the clouds. Now, here's what I want to ask you. When Jesus came at that time, did they physically see him? No. They didn't physically see him. Well, he said he's coming in the clouds. Well, he did. Now, the reason he, he mentioned clouds is because, like I pointed out last week, fog comes from where? From the ground. Where do clouds come from? From God. So God is coming down, and he's uh, going to destroy the, the uh, uh, Jewish uh, religious system in 70 AD and destroy Jerusalem and destroy the, the, the temple right, uh, by the Roman Empire, and when he does that, he says, that's the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. It's kind of like if you see me in my, if you see my Lexus driving by your house, what do you think? Mike's rich. No, my, my, Mike is in that car. Mike came by my house. Now, you might not see, actually see me, but you saw my house, right? Or you saw, you, sorry, you saw my car, so, and I'm usually in my car. That's how I come. Well, that's, that's the background that we have over here as, as we're thinking about uh, the judgment on Egypt. So when he says he's coming on the clouds of heaven, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see him in the clouds, but it's a reference, it's, it's apocalyptic language that God is coming in judgment. The judgment is coming from God down to the ground, which is why it's a cloud. And, he, and clouds are usually dark and ominous, you know, when, when they get rid of the rain. Uh, and that's what God is picturing here. Remember, it's apocalyptic language. Now, uh, uh, Isaiah 19.1. It says, The oracle concerning Egypt, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt Within them, he says, so I will incite Egyptian against Egyptian, and they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. What happens to a kingdom when it's fighting against itself? Jesus says it can't stand, right? He says, then the spirit of the Egyptians will be demoralized within them, and I will confound their, their strategy. So they will resort to idols and ghosts of the dead and to mediums and to spiritists. 
In other words, it's kind of interesting that usually God destroys a nation because they're doing these things, but he says these people are going to go back to it. Uh, and in Egypt, uh, if you know anything about Egypt, you know what the major religion is? It's not Christianity, right? Okay, it, it's still the, 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 the Egyptian idols and those things that they still worship. Now, verse 3 says, uh, um, verse 4 says, Moreover, I will deliver Egyptian into the hand of a cruel master. In other words, they're going to be defeated. And a mighty king will rule over them. That's probably Assyria or, De or um, Babylon, declares the Lord of, uh, God of hosts. The waters from the sea will dry up, and the river will be parched and dry. In other words, the, they're going to be able to cross over into the land quite easily. Verse 6 says, The canals will, will emit a stench. The streams of Egypt will thin out and dry up. The, the reeds and the rushes will rot away. In other words, when, you, when, you, when a lake or a river quits having water in it, what happens to the vegetation around it? It dies and rots, and the fish rot, right? That's what he's describing here. Uh, verse 8, he says, And the fishermen will lament, because there's no more fish, and all those who cast a, a line into the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the waters will pine away. Now, it's not really talking about the the uh, uh, Nile River is talking about the people of, of Egypt who depended on the Nile River. And, and so, you know, you would go down to Egypt to do business with them. You would find individuals that you could make money off of, like fish that you make money off of. And God's describing now they go down and nobody makes money off of Egypt unless you go down there to, to be a tourist, okay? Uh, it says in verse 9, Moreover, the, the manufacturers of linen made from combed flax and, and the weaver's uh, white cloth will be utterly dejected. In other words, their, their uh, manufacturing society is going to come to an end. He says in verse 10, And the pillars of Egypt will be crushed, and the hired laborers will, will be grieved in soul. In other words, there's no work for them. The, the princes of, of Zone are mere fools. The ad advice of Pharaoh, uh, wisest advisors, has become stupid. How can you men say to Pharaoh, I am a son of the wise, a son of the ancient king? In other words, they're, they're, Pharaoh didn't help them. You know, they claimed Pharaoh was a god. And he says, how foolish that they're, they're depending on that. Verse 12. He says, well then, uh, where are your wise men? Please let them tell you and let them understand what the Lord of hope has purposed against Egypt. So Egypt should learn something. Now, one of the things that, that as you go through these nations that I hope you learn is that God isn't just dealing with Israel. He's dealing with all the nations. And the things that happen on a national level are happening because God is trying to produce fruit from all the nations. That's why it's happening. Sometimes people go, look at America, look at the stuff that's happening in America. Why is God letting it happen? Because God is trying to get fruit. And you might say, well, how's he trying to get fruit with all this stuff that's going on? Because when people see how stupid it is, when it gets so ridiculous that everybody understands it's got to be wrong, then they start looking to somebody else instead of America in order to help them. And the other only person they can look to is God. And that's what you have going on in these, in these various uh, nations as well. God's plans for the nations is not just to destroy them, but to bring as many as he can to him. And sometimes that requires decimating their country or sometimes letting them get rich. Verse 13 says, the prince of Zon ha has acted foolishly. The prince of Memphis are deluded. Those who are, uh, are the cornerstones of their tribes have led Egypt astray. You see, their leaders have become stupid. Well, how do our leaders look today? They look pretty stupid, don't they? I, I mean, just the idea of the gender stuff that's going on, I mean, that's stupid. And, and the confusion that is causing, the difficulty that, it, that, it, that it's causing, uh, and, and, and them trying to pit races against races and, and financial people against financial people, the rich against the poor, and, the, and, and, and certain countries against other countries, and, and they're doing all this to, and it's all dumb. It's stupid. As soon as you, as soon as you learn that, then... You're going to do what's right. But verse 14 says, The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of uh, distortion. They have led Egypt astray in all that, is, that it does. As a drunken man staggers in his vomit. That's the way they are. There will be no work for Egypt, which is heard or, or uh, uh, which it, its head or tail, its palm branch or bulrush may do. In other words, the country is going to come to an end. It's going to be a third world country. But... What's God's plans in all this? 
What's God's plans when it comes to Egypt and Assyria and those and Israel, that those nations that he's punishing during this time that we're looking at here? What is God's ultimate plan in doing all this? Is, is God just sadistic? Is God just letting these things go on uh, for no purpose at all? No, there's a purpose. There's a plan for God. Verse 16 says, In that day the Egyptians will become like women, and they will tremble and be in dread because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he is going to wave over them. In other words, they're going to come. Uh, they're going to be dismayed by what God is doing. Uh, he says, the, the land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom uh, it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them. So God has a purpose for them. He says, in that day, five cities uh, in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One will be called the, the city of destruction. So in, in here, in, in verse 18, he, he's pointing out that uh, the, during the Messianic kingdom that there are going to be Egyptians that are going to come to Jesus. They're going to come to God. Are there, uh, are there during this time over here, where, we, where we're at, during our time over here, are there Christians in Egypt? Yeah. It's Christians all over the world, right? Now, not every Egyptian is a Christian, just like not every American is a Christian, uh, but there's Christians everywhere. And they have become part of, uh, part of God's people uh, by, by bringing uh, sacrifice to God. Now, verse 20 says, uh, It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of, uh, because of oppressors, and, and he will send them a savior and a, and a champion, and he will deliver them. Well, who's this savior and champion that's going to deliver Egypt? Jesus. That's why I'm telling you, these prophecies, as you read them, don't think that they happen like in a couple of years from the time they're said. Some of them take hundreds of years in order to be, in order to, to be fulfilled, and some of them are, are going to continually be fulfilled. As Egyptians come to Jesus, uh, until there is no more Egypt, God's fulfilling this prophecy that's given to Egypt. And so I'm afraid that sometimes we look at these and we say, there's a time when it happened, boom, and it ends, and then it doesn't happen, and then it's kind of over. No, it starts and it goes, and you can see it being completed over and over and over as people come to Egypt. Uh, but the fulfillment of it, we, we notice, is happening. Now, uh, verse 21, Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offerings and will make a vow to the Lord uh, and perform it. So God says there's coming a day when Egyptians are also going to be able to be blessed. They're going to be part of the community of God's people. Verse 22, the Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing. There it is. What's the purpose when God strikes? What's the purpose when you punish your children? To heal them, to yield righteousness, to, to, bring, them, to bring them to their proper senses, to heal what they're doing. Okay, If you punish your children just to punish them, then you're not doing what God says. But if you don't punish your children in order to bring righteousness, you're not doing what God says either. So we need to make sure and, and discipline our children the way the Lord wants us them to be disciplined so that we can bring righteousness. So he wants to heal them. Uh, he says, uh, the Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing, so they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them and, and will heal them. So you know that this war that's going on in Ukraine and Russia, what's God's purpose in that? Just letting people kill each other? No, he's trying to bring people who are going to turn from a physical way of thinking to a spiritual way of thinking, and they're going to be coming to God and being healed. In, in Isaiah 19, 23, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be a third part with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, uh, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, uh, saying, Bless, uh, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. During, during this time here, you have, you have e Egypt fighting against uh, Assyria, Assyria fighting against Egypt, Israel fighting against both of them, and you have them enemies, right? Well, what happens over here when these individuals, when e Egyptians become Christians, Assyrians become Christians, and the, the Israelites become Christians, what happens to them? 
They're all one. They're united. That's why God's church is supposed to be one. Okay, God's church is supposed to be one. We're, uh, when he talks about one church, he's not talking about one assembly. He's talking about the fact that there's one group of people that belong to God everywhere in the world. Everywhere, there's a group of people that are being faithful to God. There are some people in this church that are not being faithful to God. There's other people in this church that are being faithful to God. There's some people that are just learning to be faithful to God. There's some people who don't want to be faithful to God. The church are those people who are faithful to God wherever they may be, whether they're Egyptians, whether they're Assyrians, and so he says they will come and they will be his people. All right, chapter 20. Uh, chapter 20 is a, a pretty short little chapter, uh, and it's simply sp uh, speaking to them uh, about uh, uh, Egypt and about Cush and about their relationship with, other, with each other in chapter 20. Uh, and, and it's the carrying away of Egypt uh, and uh, uh, the Euphrates into cap. I'm sorry, and the Ethiopians into captivity. It says in verse one, in the year that the commander uh, came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and captured it. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, "Go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips." and take your shoes off your feet. In other words, he's telling Isaiah to be a, a physical illustration, a, a, a physical parable. He says, go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips and take the shoes off your feet. And he did so going naked and barefoot. Now, why would he go naked and barefoot? Verse 3, and the Lord said, even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign and token against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, young and old, naked and barefooted, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Uh, Where did my cursor go? There it is. To the shame of Egypt. He says, then they will be dismayed and ashamed because of Cush, their hope, and Egypt, their boast. In other words, they can't rely on those nations. Verse 6. So the inhabitants of the coastland will say in that day, behold, such is our hope where we fled for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and we, how shall we escape? In other words, they're depending on the wrong people. So we don't depend on the nations to save us, not even the United States of America. We're God's people. We rely on God to save us, and we're going to trust him no matter what happens. And so that's where we have to stop today. Good to see you all here. Let's go ahead and have ourselves a prayer. We'll start in chapter 21 next week. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that as we look at the, at the burdens of the nations that you've recorded for us, that you help us understand some things that are going on in our world. Some things that, Father, are sometimes hard for us to understand and figure out because the world seems to be getting so immoral. But we know that you have a plan. And your plan is to bring the faithful, Father, those who will turn to you, to you. We're thankful for all the things that are happening, Father, though we might not understand them. And we pray that we might always just depend on you and trust you and realize that what you're doing will be for your glory and for our good. We praise you and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.